But some zookeepers are determined. I wonder what panda tastes like. You what? Hello everybody, welcome back to another episode of Brain Blaze. I, as always, I'm your host, Simon. I'm here, one of my writers in this case, Danny, is rid of me a script. They are, no, the saddest facts to f*** up your day. <laughs> Uh, Danny, why? And I know, I, I, I hope these are like more light-hearted ones because there's real, there's real sad facts where it's like, oh no. Like, really? Honey, you've got a big storm coming. Like, there's a, you know, the classics. Like, uh, there's more people in slavery. Is that, is that even true? Like, the thing about slavery, they're like, yeah, there's, there's more slaves than there's ever been because of like, just because there's more people. And... There's, you know, sex slavery and then like wage, is it wage slavery? What's the one where, you know, the kafala system where they take people to like Dubai and make them build skyscrapers and then they die? All that kind of f***ed up shit. <laughs> this episode's gonna be really grim. And then there's that, there's this like statistic one where it's like, okay, you think you're gonna live to like 80, right? Everyone's like, oh, you're gonna live to 80, you know, that's the average life. And it's like, well, that's the average one, right? That means for every who lives to 100 there's someone dying at 60. that's how it works right which always really like is a bit dumb because then you're like well the person who lives to 100 <laughs> they're just gonna be like forgetting where they are and shitting their pants and then the person who's like 60 is like they could have a good 20 more years ahead of them like the, the 60 to 80 is definitely a lot better than 80 to 100. so that greedy bastard who lives to 100 <laughs> and takes all those extra 20 years and i know it's not how it works but it is kind of sad and it's like oh yeah you might not live to 80. You could pop off a lot younger than that, which is a bit grim, isn't it? Anyway, on that cheery note, let's jump in. What am I watching? I don't know, but I hate it. Get ready to unlock your unbreakable creativity with today's sponsor, Squarespace. They're the all-in-one platform for building your brand to grow your business online. Stand out with a beautiful website, engage with your audience, and sell anything. Your products, content you create, even possibly your time. So let's dive into some of the exciting features that Squarespace has to offer. First up, we have Fluid Engine. With this next generation website design system, you can easily start with a best in class template and customize every little design detail using their reimagined drag and drop technology. It's a breeze to bring your wildest ideas to life, but it doesn't stop there. Oh no, Squarespace extensions are another game changer. You can connect your store to vetted third party tools and extend the functionality of your website. It's like having a whole toolbox right at your fingertips tailored to your specific needs. Squarespace offers flexible website templates that cater to every category and case. You can start with a professional template, then customize it. It's brilliant. So what are you waiting for? Just head over to squarespace.com and start your free trial today. And when you are ready to launch, go to squarespace.com slash blaze and you'll get 10% off your first purchase of a website or a domain. That's Squarespace dot com slash blaze don't forget to use the promo code blaze for an exclusive discount thank you squarespace for sponsoring this video empowering creators and now back to the video a truly successful marriage will nearly always end with one half of the couple watching the other half die <laughs> can hell danny i don't like thinking about this stuff i don't like it i don't like it don't like it, Danny. <laughs> in fact, a marriage can't truly be judged completely successful until one of you kicks the bucket. Otherwise, it's a bit like prematurely announcing the final score when there's still enough time on the pitch for a player to file for divorce. <laughs> but you've been married like 80 years. <laughs> You're like one of those bastards that sh** their pants at 100. <laughs> You're like, well, you never know, you might get divorced and hook up with like a young 70-year-old. <laughs> Whilst I'm not going to delve into anything quite as dark as poverty or nuclear war or suicide or Nickelback's tour schedule, I still, God forbid, I actually don't mind Nickelback. Look at that photograph. Look at this photograph. Every time I do it makes me laugh. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. I'm talking about that Nickelback song, Photograph. Look at this graph. But I still thought it might be fun to reflect on some of the more unusual true facts which reveal just what a sad old world we temporarily live in with our bodies before they decompose into maggot food. <laughs> Sorry if you were enjoying your day, Danny! I, like, the whole death thing just makes everything feel so pointless. It's like, why am I sitting here at this desk making this video? And it's like, oh, just to entertain some people. And it's like, well, what's the point? Because everyone watching this video will one, be, one day be dead. And this video will be just lost into, like the archives of the internet and then the planet will be destroyed by like a meteor and then there'll be the heat death of the universe and nothing will have ever mattered so it's like what's the f***ing point i'm gonna go for a walk not really i'm here making videos <laughs> let's try to push those thoughts out of our minds and continue it's up to you 
Do you want to continue or not? The loneliest sound in the world. Is this the one about the whale? <laughs> Danny, we're doing, it's like we're doing the heat death of the universe and now nothing matters. Like, ultimate nihilism. And it's like, oh, there's a sad, lonely whale. Oh, boo-hoo for the sad, lonely whale. Who apparently that guy who was in Entourage then made a documentary about. That's what he did after Entourage. He was like, I'm going to make a documentary about lonely whales. It's not okay. <laughs> now, what is it, child? I love you. I always thought that the loneliest sound in the world was the chime of a doorbell being pushed by a Jehovah's Witness, but oh no, Simon won't be able to hear this right now, as he took the baffling decision to record this video before handing it over to the editor, but I'm assuming that Sam has finally woken up after last night's wild mushroom party, and now we're listening to a short clip of the real loneliest sound in the world. I don't feel like I'm missing out, to be honest. <laughs> You guys get a better experience of these videos than I do, which is nice. I don't even watch these. <laughs> is that bad? I know I should watch my own material, but I'm very busy. <laughs> I sound like, don't, don't get me wrong. Like, I appreciate what Sam does and everything, and I do watch them occasionally, but I don't watch all of them, which is bad. I'm sorry, Sam. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I don't need friends. They disappoint me. It might not sound particularly sad on first listen. In fact, it might even sound quite beautiful. It is, after all, the sound of a whale. The whale goes by the nickname of 52 Blue, and his song was first picked up in the Pacific Ocean in 1989 by the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute in Massachusetts. The US Navy had partially declassified their sound surveillance system designed for detecting Soviet submarines after what was deemed to be the end of the Cold War, and the institution was able to use the same hydrophone technology to pick up the funky tunes getting banged out by 52 blue shout out to his family i don't think he, he knows his family because he can't talk to them because he's like at the wrong fre frequency or something it's important to us so so sad it's important to know <laughs> such a dick i just feel like uh, it's sad there's a lonely whale okay but it's not as sad as, like, everything else we talked about in the bloody introduction, is it? It's important to know the Blue 52 has never actually been seen. It's just his mating call, which has been tracked and recorded every year since then. But the sad part is that nobody else in the ocean is listening to Blue 52. <laughs> Blue 52 is like an incel whale, isn't he? He's the whale incel. He got his name from the frequency at which he sings, the incel frequency of 52 hertz. But the problem is that most other whales communicate at a much lower frequency of between 15 and 25 hertz. From now on, we'll call that the Chad frequency. So, although 52 Blue has spent the last three decades traveling up and down the Pacific Ocean while calling desperately for a mate, he has never received a response because no other whales can hear his incel call. And if that wasn't bad enough, Enough, Blue 52 doesn't even follow the same migration route as other whales, reducing his chances ever further of getting jiggy with it under the sea. He's like, he's he's walking to school. Oh, while all of the Chad whales are like, they got cars. And what's that big pickup truck? I don't know why I always imagine American high school. I don't know. I, I obviously went to British high school, which was very different. But I imagine like, because I've seen so many movies and right now I'm watching the, uh, the OC again, that show from like 20 years ago. You know what's crazy about that? I remember watching that and the kids in it were older than me. And I was like, whoa. Okay, they were, uh, but like roughly the same age. And now I'm like watching that show and it's like, yeah, I identify more with the parents. It's crazy. It's only been like 20 years and it doesn't feel like that long ago. And now it's like, oh my God, yeah, no, I, I, I have the parents' problems now, not the kids' problems. This is why Blue 52 is often considered to be the loneliest creature in the world. Although I have to say, I know some humans who have had a similar hit rate down the path. <laughs> I've been calling the whale he, but we don't actually know Blue 52's gender for sure or even his species. Whilst it's been speculated that Blue 52 could be some kind of malformed hybrid, perhaps a cross between a blue whale and a fin whale, oh my god. Okay, I didn't even know that was possible. There's a more intriguing theory that it could potentially be the last surviving member of a completely unknown species on a doomed quest to find a mate that doesn't exist. <laughs> Oh no, he's an incel and he's got no, there's like no one out there he could even breed with. It'd be like being a human and you're out there with the monkeys and you're like, no, 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 10 years later. No, no, 15 years. <laughs> There's a slight glimmer of hope for every happy ending, though. In 2010, Census apparently picked up the sound, which could potentially be the song of a second high-pitched whale. If only they could bump into each other, this could turn into the most beautiful love, sto love story since The Lady in the Tramp.
Was that a particularly beautiful love story? I don't like getting real messy with that spaghetti lady. <laughs> Tramp, <laughs> if that is your real name. But failing that, maybe Blue 52. It's, it's not, I, I just keep thinking of the band Blink 182. Maybe they could play at his wedding. Bah! God, you're on fire with the jokes today, Simon, aren't you? Aren't you? You're a hilarious motherfucker. Uh, uh. Failing that, maybe Blue 52 just needs to be taught how to sing at a much lower frequency. He could do worse than take a few lessons from Elizabeth Holmes from Theranos. <laughs> He's going to prison soon. I was reading an article about like, she was not going to prison because she was like, contesting something and all of this and then the article was talking about what life's gonna be like for her in prison and i'm like wow 10 years ago you were a billionaire and that's like she'll wake up at 6 a.m for kitchen duty and it's like oh dude <laughs> after being a billionaire <sighs> i smell trouble aside from maybe the smell of the interior of a branch of crisp crispy cream there's surely no finer smell on earth than that of a freshly cut lawn oh i know this one that this is the smell the smell of the cut lawn is like some hormone or some shit that the grass release and this grass is saying like help help or be afraid of the grass we're getting destroyed spoiled it didn't i didn't i great job it's a whiff that evokes nostalgic memories of the beginning of the school holidays. Long games of cricket with Sniffer Jenkins, drinking cheap white cider in the graveyard, tentatively fumbling with Tracy Sherbet in the meadows, getting wrongfully arrested on trumped up charges of stealing a cow. <laughs> Daddy, are you just giving us your backstory? Oh, I'm sorry, I got waylaid for a second there. That's the power of the smell of freshly cut grass. However, it's not such a great feeling for the grass itself because the smell is actually a chemical distress signal. Mm, big brain. It's triggered by trauma that you've just brutally inflict inflicted on the defenseless grass. What we've actually been enjoying is the smell of grass silently screaming. Well, kind of. Oh, Danny, are you just about to prove me wrong? Are you doing this thing where you're like, and that's what Simon said at the beginning, didn't he? Like a dumb dumb. <laughs> Leafy plants and grass can release all kinds of different volcanic, volatile organic compounds known as green leaf volatiles for all kinds of different situations. When the grass is getting attacked by a monstrous lawnmower, the grass releases GLV, which can contains cis cis three hexanol the aldehyde believed to be largely responsible for the distinctive smell and what a good smell it is it reminds me of the smell of pot like the freshly cut grass it reminds me of that same smell of like people smoking marijuana weed cigarettes and it's this particular glv which is believed to be a warning cry to other plants and insects that some human nutter is on the rampage with a bloody lawnmower It does make you wonder what course of action the other plants are supposed to do in response to the signal. It's not like grass can suddenly activate defense mode and retreat to the safety of the bushes and be like, oh no, there's nothing we can do. Maybe the grass can like wither or something, but it's going to take a while because grass ain't fast. That's for sure. And the grass is equally unlikely to activate any kind of effective attack against the humans and their blades of destruction. <laughs> it just reminds me, I've got to have the grass cut. So I'm renovating a house. I've brought this up many times before. The reason is it just like takes up a lot of my time and brain power. Like it's a surprisingly complex thing to do. And the grass is so long that the neighbors complain. <laughs> they complain to our builder be like, someone going to cut the grass because it's looking pretty ugly. And it's like, oh, okay, <laughs> fine. I mean, I'm not going to do it myself, but I'll find someone who knows how to cut grass. But the GLVs have plenty of other benefits, some of which are a bit more practical. For example, the release of certain GLVs can help heal a plant's wounds by quickly forming new cells, whilst others can act as antibiotics, which help protect the plant against bacterial infection, fungi, and frost. Holy sh**, it actually does something. The release of this particular chemical distress signal is also believed to serve as an SOS target at insects. Okay. <laughs> grass is like, help me, help me, insects, I'm being attacked. The insects are like, bro, it's a fucking lawnmower. What do you want me to do? <laughs> Wasps attack! I said no! Oh, wasp eater, quick! Whenever a plant finds itself under attack from a hungry caterpillar, it releases the GLV to attract the attention of their comrade wasps. Oh my lord, was I correct accidentally? Who swoop in and lay their eggs inside the enemy caterpillar, who suddenly loses his appetite after the baby wasp starts snacking on his insides. What the f nature? Why? Why would you be like this? So there could certainly be more useful outcome from the plants releasing this silent cry of horror. Can you imagine that the wasps come and they're like, let's lay some eggs inside that lord. Oh god! 
<laughs> wasp in your life defense. <laughs> I found like a wasp's nest the other day. I got a hot tub and I was like, I go out to the deck and there's like, there's loads of wasps coming from inside the hot tub and like I lift it up and they go nuts, man. And there's like a wasp's nest under there. So I'm like, oh, get back inside. And then I'm leaving like the house. I'm like, should I do something about that wasp nest? So I just go out there and I get a big stick and I lift up the top to it real fast and then slam that bitch down. And those wasps go fucking mental. And I'm like, I've destroyed that nest. I've destroyed that nest. And I come back way later, way, way, way later. And I'm like, mother fucking wasp nest still attached to that fucker. So I have to get some guy in to like genocide the wasps. And that's what he did. <laughs> and now there are no wasps. I hate wasps. And wasps' nests are so scary. I hate wasps' nests. All of this shit, I hate it. Bugs are one of the three most disgusting things in the world! Aside from you, what are the other disgusting things? And then there was one in my sand pit. My kids have a sand pit. What is with me in wasps' nests? And they're like, they got this little, they, they're under the sand pit and I go there and I'm like lifting up and I'm like, whoop! It was a really small one with like one or two little wasp waspies in there. So I just like flick that one in the trees like <clears throat> not with my hands with like a rake damn you know what the next thing i use that rake for there's <laughs> a bird that smashed into one of the windows and completely crippled itself and it was dead and i used that rake to fling the bird into the forest <laughs> what the f is going on I'm like some sort of nature nightmare. I just go into nature and destroy everything. Uh, but the reason we enjoy the smell so much is partly because it triggers warm summer memories and partially because it reminds us of maturing fruit and vegetables, which release similar GLVs as they ripen and get chopped to bits. It seems that everything is just screaming at us to stop. Incidentally, there's some debate as to whether these GLVs are making a significant contribution to air pollution, so it might be not too long before the screaming stops for good. What are we going to do? Like, not mow our lawn, Danny. Otis Redding's masterpiece was unfinished. Depending on your perspective, Otis Redding's 1967 classic, Sitting on the Dock of a Bay. Of the Bay. I was like, I don't know who Otis Redding is, but I do know he's sitting on the dock of the bay, watching the times. Something, I don't know the lyrics. Look, everyone knows that song though. They're sitting on the dock of a bay. I, I thought this was the same song as Hotel California for the longest time. Like, it'd be like, boo ba doo boo ba doo boo to the Hotel California, sitting on the dock of a bay. They sound totally different, but I, I did get those songs very confused. Let's say when I was a child, rather than just a few years ago when I was an adult. Okay, let's say that. <laughs> It could be about a broken and lonely man pondering the futility of life. I always preferred to think it was about a jolly old dude who just enjoyed sitting on the dock of the bay, watching all the ships coming in and then going back out again. Wait, there's a sad interpretation to that song? I was just like, all I, I love, like, just sitting there, just watching the ships go in and out, maybe having a nice icy cold brewski. That's, that's what that song's about, Daddy, and don't you dare tell me different. <laughs> it's gonna, actually, it's about genocide. Oh, for fuck's sake. <laughs> It'd be like that time I'd found out mine was actually... No, I'm just joking. I'm joking. I probably can't include that, can I? Danny, can you bleep out mine because I can't say those words? And I'm also just joking. <laughs> it didn't read mine cap and go like, oh my god, inspirational. Oh. <laughs> it was certainly a bit of a change of direction for soul singer Otis Redding, who was previously known for his raw energy and intensity. Despite the melancholic lyrics, Dock of the Bay felt more chilled out and poppy than his usual stuff and signaled the beginning of a new chapter for Otis. Having said that, he wasn't particularly well known at the time anyway, as not much of his back catalogue had seriously bothered the charts on either side of the Atlantic. That was all set to change with Sitting on the Dock of the Bay, which was de destined to become his signature tune and by far the most successful track that he ever recorded. Well, that's, that's pretty cool, right? Can you imagine you're just like doing this like, what was he singing? Like soul or something? And he's like, I'm just gonna sing pop. And that it just slapped and he becomes rich and famous that's what that's what i'm planning on my people are like yeah simon he makes this education and then it's going to be like well and then i'm going to just do cooking people are going to be like that is he found his calling <laughs> it's not cooking <laughs> it's not cooking but you know stuff like that it maybe that's maybe that's what my future will be i just stop doing this and do like i don't know diet cola reviews and people will be like he found his calling he found his genius found his calling he, that's that's simon sitting on the dock of the bay 
Tragically, though, the song was actually unfinished, and that's because Otis went and died before he could give it its final polish. If you're not overly familiar with the song, and I'm going to take a massive pun here by suggesting that Simon probably isn't, I mean, of course I'm not overly familiar with it, Danny. What do you mean, overly familiar? Like, do I know all the lyrics? No. Do I know the main lyrics? No. Do I know he's sitting at the dock of a bay? Yes. That's all, though. You may not be aware that Otis breaks out, yeah, of course I know, but Doesn't he do this? Like, I definitely know this. Before the end of the track, before he concludes with the sounds of seagulls and the crashing of waves. There's a theory that this was always just meant to be a placeholder until Otis could think of a final verse with which he never got which he never got to write. I'm not entirely convinced by the whistling part of this theory, though. Otis recorded three demos of the song with writer Steve Cropper, and the whistling is present in all three versions, suggesting perhaps that it was always meant to be an integral part of the track, rather than just some random ad lib. Sir Steve Cropper can't seem to make up his mind about this either in the past he suggested that the whistling was set in stone whilst on other occasions he's indicated that the closing of the track would have probably been completely different if otis had been able to check into the studio the following week it's widely accepted that otis himself considered the song to be unfinished and planned to spice up the quietly reflective track with the powerful backing vocals of the staple singers but he never got the chance everyone died in plane crashes back in the 1960s and otis redding was no exception really <laughs> oh. On December the 10th, 1967, his charter plane crashed into Lake Monona, killing Otis and six other passengers. Otis was just 26. The record company Stack spent several seconds mourning one of their greatest talents before calling up Steve Cropper and demanding that he finish the song as quickly as possible to capitalize on the tragic news story. You big savages. Jesus. <laughs> I'm speaking of that, if anyone dies, I'm gonna blaze it to quick brain blaze blah, 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 brain blaze video. Let's go. Cause I am just morally bankrupt. Steve didn't have time to do very much with it, choosing simply to wrap up the song with sounds of seagulls and crashing waves before it was rush released to the public. From the perspective of Stax, this proved to be a winning strategy. Despite the fact that Dock of the Bay still sounded largely like an unfinished demo, it went on to become a massive hit single and the first ever posthumous Billboard chart topper, ultimately selling 4 million copies around the world. So Otis didn't even get to enjoy this. That sucks. <laughs> <laughs> that sucks. Getting famous off and rich and famous after you're dead is f***ing pointless. Like Van Gogh, he's probably, he's, I mean, he's, he's not, he's not anything because he's dead and he was dead when he got famous and stuff. But it's like, that sucks, man. And you're like, well, don't his, his painting self like hundreds of millions and stuff. And you're like, God damn. After he was dead though. Lame. It's possible the Dock of the Bay may not have been anywhere near as successful had Otis survived to overpolish the song or give it another verse or turn it into an acid techno track. And it's of course very possible that the song may have just been yet another Otis Redding flop if it had been riding on the publicity generated by the death of the artist. Bad parenting. I used to think my parents were bad. I'll never forget the time my older brother took the admittedly quite ingenious step of hiding his cigarettes and porn stash at the bottom of a drawer in my bedroom cupboard without my knowledge. <laughs> That is a big brain thing. That is that is big brain. Of course, when my parents inevitably discovered this booty, I was the one who got a beating while my brother probably got extra pudding that evening. I wouldn't have minded, but I was only about eight years old. <laughs> Danny, what did your parents think you did? Eight-year-old smoke? <laughs> Besides, the cigarettes were silk cut and I was strictly a Marlboro man, apparently yes. Silk cut cigarettes. I just have a strong association with and is this sexist? I feel like they are women's cigarettes. They get like a purple package. It's very girly. And when I worked in a shop that sold cigarettes, only women would buy silk cut. Men brought, men bought Marlboro. Um, poor people bought JPS and people bought Rothmans. That was, that's all I know about cigarettes. That's all I know. And they contain tar, nicotine, and what's the other one that's bad for you? There are always three things they list on the side of the packet telling you like what the different things that are gonna kill you. And there's a big difference. Like you have these ultralight ones, they contain like 0.1. And then you had the main ones, which contain like 10 times as much bad sh Fascinating, Simon. Thank you for sharing this gem of knowledge. And mild sexism. <laughs> Steve.
still, to the best of my knowledge, my parents never considered abandoning me for statistical reasons, and this is where nature can sometimes be surprisingly cruel. Take grizzly bears and pandas, for example, who can both take drastic measures to solve a problem relating to numbers. If a grizzly gives birth to just a single cub, it's not uncommon for the mother to abandon the poor cub on the grounds that it didn't come packaged with any siblings. I originally guessed this might be because the grizzlies were keen on avoiding dealing with the tra- issues of only child syndrome, but it's actually because the grizzlies ideally prefer to have multiple cubs in a litter. Raising just a single cub would take up about three years of their time, so they sometimes just choose to sack the whole thing off, abandon the cub, and try again for a bigger litter the following year. That is just crazy. <laughs> It seems a bit of a waste of time when the mother has just spent the last 200 days or so in pregnancy, but they still sometimes consider it best to cut their losses. The panda comes at the problem from the opposite angle. When they have more than one cub in a litter, they often have to make a tough decision on which one to keep and which one to abandon. This is because raising one cub is an all-consuming task for the mother panda, and she's unlikely to have enough milk or energy or time to raise two of the little blighters. Pandas need to get their sh** together. I was like, oh, pandas, they're endangered. And then you hear about sh- like this and you're like man no wonder they can't raise more than one child they don't want to have sex i mean i'm sorry pandas but there's a point where it's like how much do we have to do to help you why are we doing this what maybe you deserve to go extinct pandas i mean you look nice and but really come on can you at least try like we're really trying to keep you alive can you at least try a little bit I did wonder how exactly they reached the decision over which cub to discard. Do they plump to keep the cutest one, the cub least likely to hide a stash of cigarettes and porn? Or does she get them to draw bamboo straws? The truth is that she's likely to choose the strongest strongest cub, which demonstrates a better chance of survival. But considering that they're supposed to be a vulnerable species at risk of extinction, it would be nice if the suicidal pandas tried a bit harder at their end to keep going. Exactly! I'm just saying, come on! Instead, they barely survive on a ridiculous low nutritional diet of bamboo, which they can barely even digest, and then they throw away half their litter. Even British naturalist Chris Packham has suggested in the past that we should just give up on trying to save the Doom Panda. You and me, Chris Packham. Let's go out. We should go. We should make a club and let's just go club all the pandas to death. Just get it over with because then people won't have to deal with it anymore. They'll be brilliant. Let's just get it done and divert the money and resources into something more realistic and useful, if not quite as cuddly. But some zookeepers are determined. I wonder what panda tastes like. You what? But some zookeepers are still determined to do everything they can, even if it involves a bit of a cunning deception. When a panda in captivity gives birth to twins, the zookeepers quickly move one out of the way to trick the mother into thinking that she's only had one and then embark upon a relentless game of switcheroo in which the two cubs are discreetly switched about 10 times a day to receive equal attention from their mum. Why are we trying so hard with the f***ing pandas? Why are we doing this? Just let them die. This is ridiculous. How many st- You need like a full-time staff to do that. The only problem is that she's now raising two cubs at high risk of only child syndrome. Oh no. The sun may already have exploded. It's true. The sun may have already exploded whilst you've been watching this video, but we wouldn't know anything about it until around 8 minutes and 20 seconds after the event, because that's how long it takes for the sun's light to reach the Earth. (laughs) That's scary in the way that it makes my legs hurt. (laughs) Does anyone, you know, it's like, oh, it's kind of terrifying, like right now, the uh, just gigantic speed of light, solar devastation could be headed towards us and there's just absolutely nothing we can do. I don't like it and it's not like we're even here the sudden explosion as the sun's about 93 million miles away or 151 kilometers away I think you mean million kilometers there danny so the sounds would get simply get lost in space like a yoko ono bonus track would just be absolutely clueless that the sun was destroyed about eight minutes ago of course the sun isn't going to last forever anyway although we should still have a good five billion years left before it reaches the end of its life cycle transforms into a red giant and engulfs the earth along with mars jupiter saturn and uranus and the good news is that the sun is highly unlikely to just randomly explode one summer afternoon scientists have estimated that any star would need to be around 10 times bigger than the sun which is a titchy 864,000 miles in diameter to be able to achieve a true state of supernova it's not entirely out of the question that the sun might just explode in a less powerful and dramatic manner than a supernova it could be more of a gradual deflation as if somebody had stuck a pin into the center of it in such a scenario the outcome wouldn't quite be as severe for humans and bears and lonely-hearted whales all that would happen is that all life would be instantly wiped out on the half of the planet that was facing the sun at the time oh now i'm afraid of daytime danny (laughs) 
<laughs> Following this, the planet would float out of the solar system, the oceans would freeze up, and everything would be exposed to cosmic radiation. Well, f it, maybe I really wish it was daytime, just be killed instantly. Rather than getting poisoned by radiation outside the solar system, like crashing into Saturn or some shit. It might sound a bit grim, but bacterial life forms might still stand a chance of survival. Oh, brilliant! That's such good news, Danny. I'm so pleased. In the highly unlikely event of a true supernova event, the outcome isn't quite so optimistic as that. We wouldn't even have enough time to observe the sun's light is no longer reaching us before the earth is bombarded by radiation in the form of neutrinos which would almost instantly vaporize everything on the planet we might have a split second to notice that the world was ending which would give us just enough time to blame it all on russia still perhaps ignorance is bliss and instant surprise vaporization is not a bad way to get to the end credits yeah that sounds all right <laughs> honestly. It's not as if we'd be able to do anything very helpful within a warning window of about 8 minutes and 20 seconds anyway. I don't think that painting yourself white and cowering under the kitchen table is going to cut the mustard on this one. It just might have been nice to have an opportunity to say goodbye and fret to friends and family, or just at least run around screaming in panic. <laughs> mm. Yeah, I don't know how I'd react. It's like the world's gonna end. Ah, oh, I think that'd be my reaction. It'd be like, oh, for fuck's sake, really? Really? Oh, for fuck's sake! Alternatively, you might have enough time left to watch a full Brain Blaze video, but you could at least get through eight shorts before the lights go out forever. <laughs> yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> I don't think shorts are published at the time of me recording this, but maybe they will have by the time you see this video. They're coming! Or maybe they've came. Thank you for watching. Now we're listening to a short clip of the real loneliest sound in the world.